Meet Dan Nelkin, copywriter, creative director, podcaster, and author of a self-help guide for copywriters. In the past few years, Dan has made a name for himself on LinkedIn and has become an advocate for other creatives in the ad industry to start creating for themselves. Welcome to Scratch Claw Push, a podcast about artists clawing out a place for themselves in the world. I'm Billy Joe Combs. And I'm Brendan Duke. Let's go. Usually Brandon leads off, but I've been tasked with that today because I have met you before. Yeah. So welcome, Dan. Um, our guest today, Dan Nelkin, is a creative director, copywriter, definitely, um, author of the book that I have literally right here called A Self-Help Book, or Self-Help Guide for Copywriters, which is a fabulous book, and um, podcast producer and also... Uh, I would say advocate for creatives to make things for themselves. Did I cover so, everything? So are we going to are, yeah, so are go we going to have Dan do the uh, the sixty second intro, or did you just do it for him? Oh crap! <laughs> kind of did. Um, well, maybe we could just cut this part out, and I can have him do it. Or I can do a fifteen second. I mean, that that pretty much covers it. I could try to do it. Uh, I, I watched an episode la last night. I don't Sorry, want to set a timer, but I think Billy Billy kind of covered it. I, I I I worked in advertising and still do as a creative director and a copywriter. For those who don't know, copywriter is just the person who writes the words for ads, uh, TV, radio, prints. You come up with ideas for campaigns, and so I think my entire career was coming up with ideas for brands and ad agencies. And I became so frustrated with myself as I got older, not creating for myself. And I had been chipping away at that book. It's like, I just have to finish something for me. I don't care if it does well. I only thing I wanted to help one person. I said, as soon as I finish that is going to lead to creating other things. I had to break through what was stopping me. It turns out the book has become quite popular. Uh, and it's leading to other things, but that that was kind of the start, and that's how how Billy and I connected, which which I can get into um, just through sharing content online, w which obviously I built up a following, which helped the book sell, and then just kind of went from there. So that's it. That was probably longer than sixty seconds, and it was a second intro. <laughs> um, no, that that's great. Um, so you started though in advertising. Um, yeah. Right, correct? Yeah. That's was right. that always your path? I mean, professionally, other than that, you know, it was like driving a, a forklift and doing whatever, whatever jobs I was doing before I got into advertising. So I was driving a forklift and then I went to ad school uh, for copywriting. And, that, and then I, after that, uh, I drove a forklift again because I, I didn't get a job out of school. And then eventually you have to put together a portfolio of showing your kind of creativity. You go into ad agencies and meet with creative directors, and if they like you, they they give you a shot. And so that was it. I started working in an ad agency here, and I was getting like you know the lame jobs nobody wanted. And then there was this team beside me. They were working on uh, it was a brief for McDonald's. It was potato wedge fries were back, but only for a limited time. And uh, it was TV, radio, outdoor uh, at the time, print. And the art director came by and said, hey, I don't know if you want to chuck some ideas on the wall because I didn't have a partner. I usually paired a writer with an art director. And I was just so hungry. You know, I wanted this job. I didn't really have an opportunity to that point at this ad agency. And I just went to town on this brief. And he drew up a lot of my concepts and put them on the wall. And when the creator, creative director came in and he picked about eight that he wanted him to tighten up for the presentation. And I think six of them came from my sketchbook. So um, that led to my first TV spot pretty early on. And then it just kind of started to gain some momentum from there. Did a lot of TV uh, for first handful of years. I, I love TV and it just seemed to kind of keep coming my way. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. So can I ask, you know, a lot of people I, I've kind of seen young, young creatives who want to go into advertising, but don't know which area to go into. Did you, did you know right away you wanted to be a copywriter or was it just kind of a, I'm curious how you, how you niched in that? Yeah, well, actually I was in a radio broadcasting program and uh, I hadn't really heard of copywriting. And these, these two guys came in and spoke to our class. 
and they showed us their reel of TV commercials. And I thought, man, that, that's a cool job. And then when we got into the radio program, I was having to write and, and produce commercials for the school radio station. I love that. I think it was the only class I ever really loved. And I think it's the only time a teacher ever really like loved me. And I felt like kind of seen, I was kind of a, a jock growing up in my family and my brothers were creative and I soaked up a lot of that. I didn't realize I was, and was like just starting. I found my creativity quite late. So that was it. I mean, that's how I found copywriting. And uh, I still was kind of pursuing the radio thing. And then I decided not to. And I just kept having like business ideas and came, well, how do you sell them? And then eventually I went into copywriting, which has been, you know, it's funny because it's one thing to create. Even we create this podcast, I could create the book, but there's a whole other part I'm realizing as creatives, we're so focused on creating, but then it's like, well, okay, how do we get people to listen to it? Then there's the whole marketing side of things. Even though I know lots of like really good creatives in advertising who have written books or done th and nobody buys them mm. or they have a podcast and nobody listens. So it's like, man, okay. Making it was so hard to overcome all these things, but now we have to find a way to make it. And also how do we drive people to it? Um, I think especially anyway. nowadays with social media, it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost an unwritten rule. Like you're, you're, you almost have to be your own marketing department nowadays. Cause I mean, I've, oh, I've literally yes. heard about like actors winning out roles, uh, you know, for movies or like television, um, you know, spots just based on like how many followers they had, like on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. It's such, it's so key. You think of like being an influencer it, it has really shifted. I mean, for me, like when I first connected with Billy, I had a rough draft of this book and I had heard, I think it was a Gary Vaynerchuk saying, if you're not creating on LinkedIn or TikTok, that's like not buying real estate in Manhattan in the fifties, like in terms of exposure, because so few people were creating good content was like valued because it was so like rare. So I thought, okay, it's outside of my comfort zone to share anything at that time. And I said, I'll share bits of this rough draft I have. And every week, that was my commitment. Once a week for a year on Monday, I'm going to share a, a little bit from the book. And it ended up taking me two years to publish the book. But within a year, I had developed a decent following. Within two years, it was even bigger. So by the time the book came out, a, lot, a, a decent amount of people bought it. And then, of course, because it's social, everyone shares everything. There's all these pictures of the book being shared. And then other people were buying it. Uh, so it was kind of good that it took me two years, but also I really got to see like, okay, if you don't have an audience, even you don't build the thing and then get an audience like you can, but you have to like Brandon, to your point, do the marketing for whatever it is we're creating as well. Like make a film, make it this, like uh, now how do we kind of sell it and get people to watch it? And then you're like, okay, I also want to make the next thing. Like it's, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, I th I'm sorry. Go ahead, Billy. Oh, I was going to say, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, by, by doing that, by committing and building that audience as you went, as you led up to releasing the thing, that's what allowed it to, you know, have the legs it did, right? So I've worked with companies before. I used to work for a theater company and, you know, we do Kickstarters, but a lot of companies just launch a Kickstarter, but they don't have any following to support yeah. it. And so if you are constantly putting out little things, not just counting on, hey, we've put out a Kickstarter and now we just contact our email list and hope that people will support it and hope that the, you know, gifts mm -hmm. at the end will be enough. You know, it's like you have to get that snowball, start the little snowball rolling down the hill so it becomes the avalanche, right? Yeah. I think for me, I, I, because I was so blocked creatively, my whole focus was just on making the thing. So even at last year, I made an online course and I didn't launch it proper, you know, I'll say properly. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I, I've realized, since realized the people who do well with these course launches, one, they have an audience, which I have, but two, they probably spend 90% of their time on how to, how they're going to sell this thing and 10% on making it. When I was like 99%, I made it, you know, uh, I became comfortable, somewhat comfortable on camera and figured out a little bit about lighting and made this thing, but probably made, I don't know, 10 times less than I should have. 
which is fine. It was like, it was a, this is part of the process, but the next course that I launch, I will have, have learned from that. Um, but you can't neglect that side of things, the, the market, the marketing side of things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, especially now in the, the nowadays with like the age of the influencer. Um, yeah, I just did finger quotes. Sorry, everybody. But, um, the, uh, now it's, it's really interesting to see, I guess, cause I feel like nowadays, I think maybe about like 10, 20 years ago, copywriting might not, it might've been one of the things like that's just like what they're doing, like in TV and radio. But I feel like for what you do now, it's even more like, more people are going to probably be looking at that book because now they're realizing, Oh, if I'm going to be like on YouTube, even if you're just doing like cooking videos or you're just like making stuff, you know, like now, like you've got to start thinking like people, I think a lot of people don't realize like how scripted, like everything is. Mm -hmm. And like, somebody has got to write all that stuff and you've, and then like how much planning can even go into just like a simple, you know, like a, you know, if you go watch like a, like a famous uh, cooking chain, like, you know, you know, binging with Babish or whatever, yeah. you know, like that, like that guy has to sit there and write out all that script. He's probably not just sitting there just riffing on camera. Like there's, I, I think a lot of people who are not kind of like on this side of the creative thing, who, mm -hmm. you know, they, they take for granted how much how much goes into it on the, on, I guess, like on the pre plan, I don't know what you call it, like the prep side or the, yeah. the, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the word right now, but I mean, well, yeah. yeah, like for what, like for somebody who's doing what you do, how much of how much that behind the scenes stuff there actually is. I think people, I mean, most TV ads, let's just focus on TV ads are terrible. Still yes, yeah, terrible as they are people would be so shocked with how much time and money was spent from the amount of meetings before a creative team is even briefed and how much money this client would have spent just to get to that point. And then there's creative development, the number of presentations, the feedback, and then obviously then you get into production and you're interviewing directors and you hire a production company. And then there's casting and wardrobe and, you know, this is all from writing whatever, a 30 second script on a piece of paper. And then uh, shoot days are obviously super long. And then you have alt lines you're trying on set. And then you have the edit and you have color correction, you have sound design. You ha you're like, it is an insane amount of work. Um, so, I mean, that makes the terrible commercials even more terrible. <laughs> They're like <laughs> that many people are spending that much time on them. Oh, sad. Um, I was going to say, speaking as the receptionist who, you know, worked at the front desk of a major ad agency for almost four years and having had to send like international FedEx, a wooden spoon to Canada, and it needed to be this exact wooden spoon. We can't have any other wooden spoon. It needs to get here by this date because of the shoot. And, you know, things like that, which happen frequently, like, yeah. I can vouch for that. Like the, the, the amount of detail, the, you know, like committee had to decide that this was the one wooden spoon that would work. And that's like a tiny detail. Yeah. In the commercial, oh, uh, right? yeah. It's insane. And you think it takes that much time for crappy commercials, yeah. like the better <laughs> commercials, it's even more detailed because they care about the, so much about their craft and everything, every spoon, you name it. And then I think when you have 10 people or 20 people in a room and you're like, if you say which spoon, all of a sudden people are going to have an opinion. If you're just like, let's not throw the spoon out um, unless it's super important or is the product. But yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. So I wanted to ask you, because we kind of touched on it a little bit. You were talking yeah. about how even people, you know, who are creatives, who have a creative project often don't really know how to sell it. That seems mm -hmm. like a weird paradox, mm -hmm. considering that their job is to yeah. help sell things. Well, why do you I think mean, that is? I think it's hard. It's easier to sell other people's things, first of all. And I think a lot of creatives I know. I also think a lot of creatives who work in advertising, it's like Stephen Pressfield has this thing called shadow careers, where it's like <laughs> you're almost too afraid to do the thing you want to do. So it's like, instead of being an author, you're a proofreader 
or and you just fall short or you work for a publish, publishing company, but you never fully do that. And I think a, a lot of us who are creatives, it's hard to find like a, a, a career that pays creatively. And so I think, and you also don't know what to do when I can do anything. And advertising gives you a box. Here's a product. Here's a brief. We need some ideas by this time. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're told what to do. You're put in the box. You have a lot of help in the ad agency world. Um, people take care of the marketing side that we're talking about. If you have your own, you created a podcast for an ad agency. There would be people who were promoting it, people who were buying ads, people who were doing whatever. But when it's all on you, I think it's it's different. It's a different skill set because I think the creatives would have the skill set, the ability to make something. They don't know how to selling it. It's, I think that's the difference between like advertising and marketing. Advertising, you can create the thing. Marketing is how, how to sell it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us don't know how to do that. But it's funny with the book, I, I decided, I haven't been doing it lately. I was like every Thursday on LinkedIn, I'm just going to share an image of my book and a funny headline. It's a book about writing headlines with personality. So um, I just started doing that mostly for me. It's like, I don't have to answer to the 20 people telling me, you know, which spoon to go with. I'm just going to say this because it makes me smile. And in the last three months, the book has sold more than any other month this year. So I'm like, oh, it does work. You have to also talk about the things we're making, but a lot of us aren't or feel like it's too much. But if you do, that's how people find you. Mm-hmm. So is there like have any, like any, I guess, definitive tricks or strategies you use when like marketing your own stuff? Or is it just a thing of just putting it out there and just kind of being genuine about it? I think it's more the latter. Um, for my book, it's different. It was not, it's not like, uh, I don't want to say art. It's because it's helping people write better. So it's, I was like, I'm just going to share this. I want it to be helpful. And I want it to be instantly helpful. Like not theory. Like I believe blah, blah, blah. It was like, here's a writing tip. It's called the list and twist. It's when you have at least three items in a list. The first two are super expected. And the last one is completely unexpected and has nothing to do with the first two. And I named it the list and twist. And so then I give a bunch of examples of how you would do that. So if you're writing headlines, if you're writing a subject line, you're writing anything, a text message. I do it on like grocery lists with my wife. I have all these straight things. And then I throw in some random things on the bottom just to make her smile. And so they were tips like that. And I would just every week, here's another tip. And if if they kind of had a name, I would use that. If they didn't, I would make them up. Like I made up the mullet headlines where it's like business in the front party in the back so the business what's the straight offer for your client and then twist it and any dialogue or comedy they, they use a lot of these things too and so by the end the people followed me for a year you have like 45 of these tips or 50 and then the so that was it i was like helping creatives build their craft and confidence is what i focused on so craft was like how to craft lines And then confidence was talking a lot about inner critic and self-doubt, which I've had to deal with through much of my career. And this creating is helping me kind of overcome it. And so those are the two kind of key pillars. So I wasn't selling anything. I think that helped me too. I was just trying to be genuinely helpful. What would have helped me? Because I wasn't like this lead in the world of advertising or known like I am now was like, I created this stuff because I needed it, not because I was an expert. And then people were like, oh, you're an expert on copywriting. I was like, not exactly, but I guess I think I am now. Um, So it was kind of innocent. And it was really, I was, to your point, being genuinely helpful. And so then people wanted to buy something from me, which happened to be a book. It doesn't make much money, but uh, it's leading to, uh, never. that was never the intention for me. It was just make something for yourself. And then keep making stuff. I, the, your delivery of that line was very Mitch Hedberg, and it <laughs> <laughs> made my day. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Sorry, I got caught up in the Mitch Hedberg. Where's game. the cat? <laughs> my cat left. He, uh, uh-huh. sorry, <laughs> couldn't that's keep his good. attention, but that's, that's okay. Fine. Cat. Um, Some good airtime. Yeah. No, I, I, I admire what you're doing what you've done with that idea of creating something that you needed that's kind of where i come from too in like why i started blogging 
um, you know, why I've created my accountability groups and things like that. It's, it's all, this is what I needed when I was 22 and I got out of college and I had no idea, like you were saying, the, the creatives that, you know, who go to the shadow career because they get accountability from the business world. Somebody tells them what to do, where to be, you know, they're not, uh, for me, I was always like, you know, I worked my part-time restaurant job at night. And then during the day, it's like, well, I'd get up around 10 and I'd maybe go to the gym. And then I'd be like, I'm not really doing anything. And, you know, I go to work and I kind of float. And I didn't know how to like have discipline for myself and create something or, or even like work towards something, even if I wasn't creating it myself, like how do I create this life yeah. that I envision where I get to do theater and get paid for it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a lot of people, like you said, get stuck in that world of it's easier to just answer to somebody else. Yeah. Well, there are also, it's, I don't know what I want to do. I'm waiting for like, you know, to win the idea lottery. Like it's like, ah, there it is. Like most of us, it's not going to happen. You just have to pick something. And then the other thing, you know, it's like, who am I to be doing X? that comes up for a lot of like the creatives I talk to. Mm -hmm. But for me, like the who am I to be like your help, help to help you've always needed. You're not coming out to help like the top 1% most successful people in your industry. Like they've kind of got it figured out and most of them aren't doing stuff like this. So to just, yeah, that's it. Whenever I share anything, I send my newsletter or I post on LinkedIn. It's like one person likes it if I think can help one person and like they do better than that but that's all I hope for every time and I think the thing is like you do have to get over that like habit we build habits of not creating for ourselves like for way longer than we have the other like you have to but once if you this is the thing you just have to stick with it long enough to, to then you're like I'm never that's where I'm at now like I'm never stopping like i I don't just want to teach people how to write headlines. Like this path for me, it's like, that's where it started. It was always, uh, once I've fully replaced my income, I want to shift to help other creative people create for themselves, um, which probably be next year. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've learned so much because I was just stuck for so long and just became so frustrated with myself that I just said, I can't, I can't. Like, I, I was like, are you full of shit or not? Is the point I got to. Mm. If you're full of shit, just go get a job and it's fine. But admit it because you've been doing this for a while. Like, start making something. And we just found out at that time, my wife was pregnant, which we we're not expecting. And uh, with our second child. And I thought, well, this is the perfect excuse to not you know, I could wait another five years and not finish the book or whatever. But uh, I just, I just couldn't. I was like, no, I no more excuses. I have to finish something. And so it wasn't about it being successful. It was about creating that I just need to break this habit of coming up with ideas and uh, starting them, abandoning them. You know, it was like enough to tell people about this idea and they say, oh, that's pretty cool. That's good. It'd be okay. That was like all enough, but it wasn't after a while. So, I mean, it's, it's been a theme on this show. There were people at a certain point, like when they finally start doing the thing, it's usually adopting the, you know, I call it like the why not me attitude yeah. uh -huh. where you start thinking, well, mm -hmm. why, why shouldn't I be the one that comes out and does, you know, X, Y, Z, because I mean, yeah, other people are doing it, but what if my thing, what if my particular take on that ends up being the one that, you know, yeah. is the best. Yeah. And then if you, if you just like creating and you believe what you're doing is of value, like I stopped, you know, I had tried to like rationalize when people first started calling me an expert. So I was like, this is not me. Like nobody's ever called me this. And I was like, Oh, an expert is just an idiot who committed to an idea or committed to a path. And like mm. you think like before, anyone ever called me something like that you're like oh they're just special people they were born and they had the perfect parents and the perfect upbringing and they have a wizard hat and that's why they're experts but it's like it's just not true you know you just you spend more time on something than other people it doesn't take that long either so like i'm gonna help people with x 
Or yeah, there's, yeah, there's a very action. famous, very famous quote from like the martial arts world. They say a black belt's just a white belt who never gave up. Yeah, awesome. And That's it's great. It sounds like you just adopt that same thing. Just keep plugging away, yeah. you know, or like I've, I've, I've taken to calling it like a stone cutter mentality. Cause it's like a mm -hmm. very famous, uh, they call it like the stone cutters creed. Mm -hmm. It's a quote, I think by Jacob Reese. And if I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but it's talking about like, you know, when I, you know, when I get discouraged, I look at a stone cutter, you know, I'm just hammering away, you know, and on the 101st blow, the stone splits and, splits mm -hmm. in two mm -hmm. and i know that it was not the 101st blow that did it but the hundred that went before mm -hmm. yeah awesome so i want to ask you um because this is kind of as we talk to more people i'm starting to kind of you know there's themes that come up there's things that keep happening you my brain's going in two different directions right now um there are <laughs> two different things um one do you think that doing this for yourself and tell me what, what was this the beginning of 2020 that this kind of all started or was it before um, that? Well, no. Well, I started creating content. It's just 2020. Mm -hmm. I don't know when December, maybe December. Of okay. Cause I knew it was so. sometime while I was yeah. here in Atlanta. Um, yeah. Do you think that, committing to yourself in that way and committing to your ideas and creating these things, do you think that has made you more you? For sure. And I think what's been so cool about it, like if you're sharing authentically and you're getting positive feedback, back, it's you, it's your value. It's not for another company and, and seeing your, your value for sure in the world. And Nick, hardly a day goes by where I don't hear from someone saying, thank you. Some kid in an ad school, someone who's working in an ad agency, someone who owns an ad agency saying how the book has helped them or my courses help them. Or, man, that feels so awesome. I, I feel like I don't create super uh, quickly that I'm still in my head a bit too much. Like, mm. I don't know if it's effortless for some creators where they're just like, mm, this is just like how I feel and I'm going to share it. I'm not there yet. I, I'm still too in my head. I'd like to become a bit more, I don't know what it is, like more more me. I think I'm finding my voice still. It's taking me a little while, but uh, I, f I found uh, a few parts of it for sure. Cool. But it's probably one of those things where you're like peeling back the layers of the, onion. you know, like there's always more parts of you and it's it's so freeing. Uh, and then I'll, or, I'll, or I am getting quicker. More or it's the, uh, the whole like, you know, uh, the Michelangelo quote Age. about making sculpture or like, mm -hmm. like, you know, he's just, he said the sculpture was always there. I'm just chipping away all the, mm -hmm. the non-essential stuff. And mm -hmm. I feel like the more you're putting stuff out there, I mean, it's, it is kind of like a de facto process of elimination. You know, you just, you have to make the choice and go with it. So you throw it out there and if it works like, okay, lean into that a little more. And if it doesn't work, okay, well that's, yeah. 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 Like, are, and like how, like, so, you know, are you out there like kind of noticing, I guess, once you kind of start getting in that mindset, are you kind of also looking at everybody else's like social media posts or other, you know, like you've obviously been in advertising for also like, is it when you get to that, like a little bit more of a critical mindset, looking at other media saying, oh, I think this is, this works, that doesn't, and then I kind can, of carrying it forth. I mean, because I only really only create on LinkedIn and then I have this email newsletter that I send out. I notice it there, but the one thing that's changed is I don't consume that much content mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. I just, I, cause I create, it takes me this time to come up with ideas and write the piece or create the piece. And then I'm just getting feedback and responding to comments and other people will share the book. I'm responding there. So I really control that medium. Uh, or that network where, where others where I consume, I hate them less, you know, <laughs> like this is so negative. Uh, but on LinkedIn, I'm creating, I'm sure it would be the same once I start creating on other, other platforms. Um, but I, I definitely see people and see their content and I'm like, Oh no, you shouldn't be doing that. Like uh, I learn from people. There's also people who I learn from who 
it's like they've never had a job in their life. All they've done is figured out how to post on LinkedIn. And then they teach other people how to post on LinkedIn. And I'm like, this is such junk. And there's so many people doing that and doing better than, than all of us combined. And so, you know, I don't like that, but I also look uh, at their stuff and I have met with some of them and a couple of great guys. I met, I won't say this because then you might know who it is, but he's one, I'll just say one of the top traders on LinkedIn. Um, but you know, he's like a single dad, he's 30 and I don't love some of the stuff he creates. It is helpful, but it just feels very much like this is what works on social. And so I'll do this. But you can learn from like how, okay, I don't do that, but I do this and I can take parts of and learn from learn from him and, and how he creates. So I definitely consume in a different way where I am like trying to learn from people and also, you know, sometimes making fun of people on there, uh, not directly, but how they create and calling it out. And it's like great content for me. Um, yeah. Well, it- it sounds like what you're saying about the way that they're creating is they go, oh, the things that work are A, B, C, D, and E. So we're going to yeah. put all those things in this thing, yeah. no matter what the creative or my voice might be. If you just yeah. put in these benchmarks, yeah. then it will work. Yeah. This is what human brains will respond to. And so I'm going to just do that. And I think, yeah, for people who are creative, I mean, there's there's nothing creative about that. It can be frustrating because you see them grow really quickly, uh, but they're mm-hmm. I don't know, kind of preying on, uh, you know, deficiencies in our brains, which is what a lot of social media does. My book. So when my book launched, I didn't even know there was a ranking system on Amazon. I had, no, I, you know, I didn't know. I was just like, yeah, hey, there we go. I'm hating my job right now. I need a win for me. I'm I'm ready to hit publish today. So then the thing starts to sell and then I go on to Amazon and there's the advertising category. It's like, you know, Oh, number 79. I'm like, guess that's good. I had no idea. Then it's like, okay, 50. And it gets to like 25, 10. And then it gets to number two in the UK, in Canada, in the U S I didn't even know how to check maybe other countries. And the book that was number one, was I don't know if you've seen this guy or heard of him, but Alex Hermosi, a hundred million dollar offers. He's like always in his like muscle shirt on Instagram, um, whatever. He's like quite quite wise, but he's anyway. After a while, I listened to a bit of his book, and he talked about this like human psychology, and he said, and how you could complain about how uh, people ought to be, or you can embrace. Uh, who they are because this is a book for people who want to be rich not right (laughs) something like that and i was like oh interesting because that's how a lot of those people create it's like this isn't a value to me i i i don't care but i know people will respond to it so i'm going to do it because it's going to make me money Mm -hmm. it was very foreign to me but i'm also like okay that's what works so how do you do what we do and things that are of value but also learn learn from that. You don't have to do that, but there's like, um, probably maybe it's like five or 10%. There is a way Like, can you do it in a way that feels like ethical and yeah. with quality content? Probably. Um, but it's interesting because th- those are the people who are kind of winning. You know, like, uh, and then uh, if you don't do it, you don't grow as, I don't know. I feel like there should be a middle ground, right? Like, yeah. Like I used to work for a theater company and, and I, at the time I had also just come off of working at the ad agency and I read a lot of books about marketing and, you know, read, read books about like psychology and how to get people to agree with you or to say yes to things. Right. And, um, about getting people to donate money to your campaigns and things. And I remember going to them and being like, Hey, if we just use this language, slightly tweak the language we use when we're calling people on our email list and saying, Hey, we are having this campaign we're seeking donations like if you just tweak the language and approach it this way it this book is saying that you'll get more Mm -hmm. donations and they're like uh i don't know that just feels wrong to us that's not how we talk and i was like but you're not it and they're like it feels manipulative and i'm like okay get it but it's these people already support you they already come Mm -hmm. to see all your shows they yeah. sometimes give money. If they're yeah. more likely to give money, you're not 
holding a gun to their head. You're yeah. not, you know, so I, I was kind of like, there has to be a middle ground between mm -hmm. realizing you might lose your company if mm -hmm. you can't get people to donate money to yeah. support your stuff or come, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and just saying, no, we, we, we can't do that ever. We can't yeah. change the language <laughs> or, or do marketing slightly yeah. differently. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you can't say like, oh, I, yeah, I can't. If you, if you are selling something, you have to do some of that. And I think if maybe if what you're selling is of value and it's genuinely helpful or quality or like something you believe in, which I think these people do, it's just, I don't know, in my brain, it gets all mixed up. There's this like icky feeling, like even for my course, I was told, okay, you need to double the price. So then when you promote it, you're like, it's 50% off. I've gone crazy. You can get it for this price. And I'm like, so obviously I didn't do that, but I was like, I did. Cause this is what you're supposed to do X, but it just didn't feel right. So now actually what I've done now is reached out to a bunch of people who have taken it and I'm trying to gauge what a fair price would be. And then I'm going to add more value to the course mm -hmm. and charge what it should be. So it's not a, and then it's on me to prove the value of this course. This is what it will help you with. And I've added it, this, this, and this. And probably my little campaign for it will be like not on sale now. You know, uh, I will just embrace that it's not discounted and that I'm, I'm not going to do what these people do. And I will say in the newsletter, this is what I was told, but this is what it's worth. I'm not doing that. Um, and so I'll probably have fun, fun with that and, and make fun of how people do it and see maybe, uh, maybe it'll work, but I know it's a value. This is the other thing I'm, I'm doing is getting tons of feedback and I'm updating it, just convincing myself of the value. So then I don't have to be like timid about selling. It's like, I know this will help you with this. It's helped this many people. And if you struggle with this, it's going to take care of that. Would you pay this for that? I would have paid 10 times that early in my career. Uh, so old, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's one of the hard things about um, working with creatives just in general, but especially creatives from my world where we don't really make any money at all. I mean, I guess uh, advertising creatives when they start out, maybe not, but convincing them that the investment for uh, something is worth it, that it's going to have an ROI for them, that it's going to, you know, and I think some of it is very esoteric. Like we're talking about like, are you going to be more you and have more of your voice? Are you going to be more confident mm -hmm. and therefore able to move around in the world better because you have this confidence that you know what you're talking about now and you offer value, right? Mm -hmm. If you can get people convinced that that is something that is going to get them further in the world, that that is going to get them better salaries, mm -hmm. better positions, et cetera, then you could sell, you know what I mean? Then you can convince them yeah. that this thing has value. I think what I'm realizing is like the first person you have to convince of the value is yourself, right? Like I've been asked to speak to different brands and agencies uh, or around the world since I started this path, all from here in my son's bedroom. I was asked uh, recently by this company in, uh, I don't know if it'll happen or not, they're changing dates, but flying me out to Allentown, Pennsylvania. And potentially speaking, and I'm like, well, because I became somewhat known in the industry during the pandemic, everything has been virtual. So I reached out to an ad agency here and said, hey, can I come give this talk for free in person, which I've never done. And I, I needed to do that because I needed to take some pressure off. I needed to like do the talk, which I did last week and get feedback just to prove the value to myself. Because, and I've, I've done that and they gave me some great feedback. So I will improve it. And now I have the confidence because I have, I've been somewhat timid about promoting the talk because I, I kind of create a lot of this in a bubble, just myself. I'm like, yeah, this would have helped me, but eventually you need some feedback. Um, and so that's what that was. And, and this is the phase I'm in with the course with that. It's like, convince yourself, prove that this is super valuable. And then I will not have, I'll be easy. It'll be easy for me to, to talk about it more. Yeah. So you, it sounds like you almost, you're, you're using yourself as a, your, your own kind of beta tester or whatever, like you know, with this, with this information, like, okay, well, if, if I'm finding, you know, if, if 
if it's working for me, I'll know it. And it's it's yeah. kind of like, or like or was the was the old uh, the old commercial where the guy's like, I'm not only the president of the hair club for men, I'm also a client. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like I actually do use this stuff, so yeah, it's made me a lot better, faster writer. So, um, but I mean, that was the thing, though. I didn't know. I, it's been like really comforting, actually, like with the book, because you're like, I, I don't know who this is gonna help. It just shows like how much we have in common, like even the creative process, the self doubt and all that. I'm like, you know, I have people reaching out who are partners in the top agencies in the world and people who are just starting their career and in school. And uh, they're like, yeah, I feel the same way. And I think that's why, because I, I wrote it a little gently. I mean, it's called a self help guide for copywriters. So um there's some of that in there about the creative process so i think people just have like connected with me in that too and i i remember as i was writing it i was like okay how did i need to hear this and and what did i need to hear and how did i need to hear it and the whole point was for it to be helpful so even if there were lines in there that were kind of funny if they were getting in the way of it being helpful which was kind of number one i would take them out i put there's lots of pictures in there because i'm like okay tension spans who's reading books like i even me as a writer, I'm not reading as many books. So it flows really easily and, you know, short. So all of that was kind of intentional. And yeah. Well, you mentioned Pressfield and his books are yeah. immensely, they're short, but there's yeah. so much, you know, he, he writes the war of art and uh, do the work and all those in such a way that like, it's very dense. It's very, it's very value heavy mm -hmm. while being super, super fast to get through. Right. Yeah. So was yeah. he kind of inspiration? I think a lot of those books were like, I wanted it to, to get through it quickly. I wanted to like have the feeling of like, I don't want to say like scrolling on social, but like turning pages quickly. Mm. So spacing between paragraphs, short paragraphs, instead of long paragraphs, I wanted to have more blank, some blank pages in there that, and I would even just say, this is, this is for you. This is a freebie for you to just flip and go. Um, actually, I should have done that because my, my thought was, they said you couldn't do the printer, like just this many blank pages, but I could do, if I do another edition, I think I'll just write funny lines on them. Like even one, we'll have one word on them and you've just turned five more pages. Go you, you know, like I think rewards in there to get them through. Or, or, you're, or you're being avant-garde. There's a, I don't know if you've heard, <laughs> there's this uh, book called House of Leaves. House of Leaves. I was oh, just yeah? thinking about House of Leaves because of that. Oh my God. Yeah, where it's literally like, there's certain parts of the book is just like one word on it's one page. It's a very different type of book though. It is. Mm -hmm. It's. It's. But at the time, it was like I think it was such a a novel concept. Like when it came out, I remember it, and they're just like, because like he's the guy that's like he's trying to do it like almost like hyperlinks, like certain words would be like mm -hmm. in blue, and then he'd have like the footnotes would actually be like part of the story. So he was getting like huh. really meta with it, and nice. and of course I feel like it's and and they would this was of course before social media came along so like nowadays like we're just so accustomed to that mm -hmm. that i feel like it's really kind of changed the way people are reading it and like say for you is do you feel like it's more of just like a a, a process of just meeting people where they are versus kind of where you wish they were yeah i think it's just accepting where we are too like and I, again like man i don't know like, would you say I'm I'm not only the the owner, I'm also a, a member or whatever. That's how my I know writing a book and I, or re reading books, how how I felt consuming them, which books I'm into now and not. When I'm feeling like, oh man, I don't want to read that. Just to look at a block of of words now is intimidating. Like, should be spaced out. I've always felt like it probably always should have been. When you look at how how we read, whether it's it's on Twitter or X. Uh, even LinkedIn, the posts that do well, it's not a blob of copy. It's like one sentence, short sentence, another short sentence, two short sentences together, space. Like some of it's a bit ridiculous, but you're like, oh, that flows. There's actually an author called Dave Trott. He's a marketing advertising guy. Man, he's written like four books. And this is kind of before people were writing this way. And I'm sure he just did it. Like this actually feels better. This flows better. 
and it's how he wrote and it's like books full of like short stories and kind of metaphors for like marketing and advertising but they're they're awesome they're so smart yeah i mean especially i mean like nowadays because i i mean on one hand like you know you consider we can all sit around and lament like oh yeah people aren't reading books like people are reading they're not just yeah. they're not and i guess too it's it's also like the thing you know just maybe it's more like a modern thing. Cause like, I remember I've like, I've gotten point where like I can go back and look at some old books and just go, good God, this is some long winded, you know, <laughs> stuff. Edgar Whereas like someone, huh, huh? Edgar Allan Poe is the king of the run on sentence. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. There's, there's some, definitely some, so I remember uh, what I was talking to a guy at work who was a big reader and he, he was, he was telling me about some book where it was like almost like an entire page was like one sentence and it's all like is a setup almost to like a joke where it was like describing this person like saying and it's like blah 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 and then they were such and such and such and such and such and such and, such and, such. and they were also ugly or something like that and it was just like <laughs> it was just like this this giant setup but it's like that yeah. is such a hard thing to do and especially now in the age when it's like the or the age of the tweet where it's just like bam here's the thing this is what it is you know, you mm -hmm. bring into it whatever else you will, but it's it's almost and it gets more into that line of what was the uh, the, the 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 stereotype of like Ernest Hemingway back in the day, or like when mm -hmm. you ever see him like a movie, it's like if the prose is clean and it's yeah. you know uh -huh. it's just yeah. like stripping away all the non essentials, but at the same time, like it, it, it in doing that, you as writers, I know we always kind of want to have our little you want to put your your fingerprints on it, but that's a very tricky line to walk. I think that helped me like obviously working in, I would like to write things that aren't ads or about advertising, but, uh, and, and I do occasionally, but when I think of like writing for a 30 second radio or even a 15 second TV spot or a six second YouTube pre-roll, like you don't have many words like, and so I think it's really helped me. I'm like, okay, a book was really long. Even my short book felt really long. I'm like, there's a lot of lines in here that if we overanalyze every single line, like a headline and an ad. And now I have how many sentences in this book? I don't even know. Um, so yeah, it just felt really long to me, feels, even feels at its current length. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's like a superpower to like edit your work and like how much of this can I still say the same thing and and cut half of it we usually can and it usually gets better not just going back to radio scripts and blobs i remember writing radio scripts man if i could look at old radio scripts like especially announcer reads they weren't broken up it was just like a blob of, of it was just a paragraph i think i would i would not write them the same way today for someone to read them well like i'm just been yeah, it's been a theme on this show where I, sometimes it's like the constraints can actually be the thing that kind of pr propel you forward. Because yeah. I guess maybe, and maybe like in you, because you're kind of alluding to it there, like sometimes just there's just having that extra stuff taken away. So now it's like, mm -hmm. I guess, wandering through a wide open field versus just going down like a per one lane. It's like now yeah. you have a direction. So just go totally. versus it's even for all those people who don't know what to create. Like, Spend 10 minutes every single day thinking about what to create even. Then you're like, you're getting somewhere. You have 10 minutes as opposed to it could be anything. And you just go through life going, I want to make something. And I kind of have this and kind of have that. Like, Also, if you just choose something, it doesn't have to be the thing that defines you. But now you're making something. Like, And then, then you just understand how it works. And now I can choose the next thing and build that. Like it's it's not... It's just so important to pick one thing and start. And I think confines really help. Like for me, once a week for a year. That was, And I had a rough draft of this book, so I kind of had a head start on it too. I had like some content I could pull from. So yeah, I know not everyone wants to do that, but whatever you're creating, like create those boundaries. Just start making stuff. Do you feel like demystifying it to some way helps as well? Because I guess especially I guess like in the artist, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool because of what you do and when it's for a more business mm -hmm. yeah. oriented thing, whereas like mm -hmm. you have a very specific goal. It's like, okay, I need to sell these shoes or I need to sell this okay. car. Yeah. But I mean, the same, some of the same tricks can apply in the creative thing. It's just kind of like, it's like at the end of the day, you're just putting words on a page to 
do to accomplish X, whether it's to sell a car or some shoes or versus I want to tell the story of this guy who, or this guy or this girl who does this thing. Mm -hmm. And, and like, have you found that just taking that kind of like that Mm -hmm. art, the, the kind of creative woo woo sheen off of that and just kind of getting it down to that practical, almost like mathematical approach helps. That's helped me big time kind of controlling the chaos. And you, you look at someone like Jerry Seinfeld, like he sets a timer. That's the reward for his sessions when they go off. And every single day he writes a joke and he did the thing, you know, where he does the, like on the calendar, he does a little mark for every day. And once you see the marks all pile, you don't want to stop and break the chain. And so that structure, a lot of the most like prolific creators in any field have are very routine and structured. Like maybe nothing comes out in this hour or four hours but this is my time. Okay. And then they move on. Like it's, it's a sacred time. And a lot of it is like, you know, as I am breaking down creativity and thinking about it, which I've never done before. Like you think when when we get ideas or if you ask someone or any of us to like define creativity, most people say, Oh, it's when you combine, uh, you know, two things to create something new. But I'm like, who is that helping to make things? Like, it's never helped me come up with an idea, but as I've started breaking down work and not just like advertising work, I realize it's two unrelated things coming together. Like, because that's when the, I'll to tie it back to advertising. Whenever I would get a sponsorship brief, like, oh, McDonald's is a proud sponsor of the NHL or hockey, you immediately start getting ideas because you're like, well, oh, a French fry in the shape of a hockey stick. We can use the top of a bun for a puck. We can whatever you know you can just start coming up with ideas ronald mcdonald's missing two teeth i I don't know like (laughs) you combine these two worlds and you look at a lot of like you know mockumentaries or that they're combining like it's a documentary with satire or different genres coming together horror and comedy you're like "Ah, okay and then you just start to get ideas when you bring these two worlds together two different characters together but if you have the same it like often we're stuck because we're thinking like so linearly ideas within if it's about speed but you're like okay introduce something else like and so yeah i i think through like teaching this now i'm i'm really thinking about creativity and totally demystifying it of course, it's going to be hard and it's going to be unknown. But I think the the like tortured artist that so many people buy into is just so damaging. A lot of that, I think you look at top creators, they're not like that. Or, you know, you mentioned Mitch Hedberg, the ones who are tortured, don't hmm. make it that far. Like just buying into that is, is, I think it's just bullshit and it's just so damaging and we can take ourselves more seriously. I think we'll be more successful with like combining like left brain structures with right brain creativity. That's how we will win. But as opposed to just being in one place, very few people can, I think, do well doing that. You have to embrace the other side or partner with people who do the things we don't do kind of maybe marketing and stuff like that. I want to, I want to bring it back to something from a little bit ago. You did mention, you kind of alluded to that, and this is something that comes up with us a lot and we always want to kind of ask about creating for yourself you said has brought you certain opportunities i'm just curious you you didn't really go into that so can you tell us more about what kinds of opportunities or what kinds of things how how has your world expanded in that way since okay. creating for yourself that's an easy one so then here's the thing with social do i think what before you create or when you're going to start sharing things with the world you worry about I mean, some people more than others, but like judgment or who am I and all of these things, like the people around us. But like, I judged an award show in Nigeria. Like, I was on this webinar in Australia where, I don't know, it was like 1,200 people showed up. They asked me to come on. It was hundreds of people in the UK. So it's like, you realize that it is global. Like it's the world. And I mean, that sounds like big and like grand, but there's also... Whether I, I just did, actually, we're recording this on Riverside. I did some work for Riverside based in Tel Aviv. The, this w- was like limited to the city I lived in and the opportunities here. Also, 
when I'm post started posting regularly, the amount of like, I don't say jobs, but I just wasn't on the radar of this many people. And even before I had a, a decent sized following, I'm getting messages from people I'm getting. And then it's helpful content. So schools around are saying, can you speak to this class? Uh, obviously podcast opportunities. I share one thing that does well. There's so many people like us who are creating content that if it's in line with what you're doing, well, obviously even this opportunity today, like one post does well uh, in my inbox, there'll be people asking me to do X, do you do this? I'll speak on a podcast and say that I'm now speaking uh, to ad agencies and brands and someone will say, Hey, I heard you on the podcast and I get messages. So also like just from a personal level, like you and I, Billy, you've supported me so much through this and we've connected and I'm, I've met so many amazing people around the world. And I think, yeah, I just, I just start to see how potent you are once you start creating and see the reaction it's, it's pretty awesome i agree with that <laughs> um yeah well we're coming to the end of our hour but that's just because um, you have to go billy you're, you're, you're know, in a rush you gotta well you know i well, she's she's in, she's in demand so you know that's <laughs> good for you that's awesome. i actually i get to go work with a copywriter that i used to work with at bbdo oh, and so nice. um you know, once again, wouldn't probably have this opportunity if I didn't know yeah. someone. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels good when I get to work with people who I love working with. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we usually uh, finish up by asking where we can find you. But I want to ask one other question before we get to that. Okay. We were talking about how I think kind of like taking the art and giving it more space, but also condensing it can make it more elegant, I want to say, right? Like having more white space, formatting it in a certain way, but also, you know, instead of having all that text, like how can I say this in less words, right? Commercials to me, I love advertising. That's just a weird thing about me that a lot of a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, shut these commercials off. And I have always, in junior high when I was 12, my room was covered not in posters of cute boys but of ads yeah, wow. constantly just ripped out of magazines mm. ads and they honestly some of them really inspired me when i was mm. 12 and awkward right mm. some people say that's negative that you know it causes bad things it can for me the types of ads i was looking at i felt very aspirational you know mm -hmm. And I've seen ads since that I'm like, this is a work of art. Mm -hmm. Some of them, the best of them can be yep. because it's not, it is about selling something, but it's also about selling the feeling, right? You sell, mm -hmm. you get someone to feel something so that they want something. And then what is the benefit of that benefit, which is how they're going to feel. So the ad I saw was like, you know, about mascara and it was like the benefit of the benefit is I get to stop being a chubby 12 year old and become this swan 16 year old someday mm -hmm. who, you know, her crush will like her. Right. So those are the things that, that it can be. I'm curious if there is a single ad that made you want it, want to become, be into advertising, or if there's an ad that just sticks with you that you yeah. think is great. Yeah. I have, I have one that's, I, it's an older ad. Someone shared it recently. It's very much relates to like the importance of creating for ourselves. So it was for Xbox and it's based on a true story. I think it was actual like footage from a lab. I can find it, send it to you. We can share it. Anyway, in the lab, they say, uh, if you put fleas uh, and they talk about how high fleas can jump, whatever, let's say three feet. If you put fleas in a jar, they'll jump out of the jar. If you put a lid on the jar, the fleas will jump and they'll hit their head a few times and then they'll learn that, okay, I can't, this doesn't feel good. And they stop, they stop about an inch short. Mm -hmm. if, if you take the lid off, they never jump out. If you dump the fleas out of the jar, they never ever jump any higher ever. And all of the flea babies they have never ever jump any higher than that height. And so this is one of the things when I was like, when my daughter was about to be, 
born. I was like, I have to, like with this book, it was just so motivating because I do feel like it's me jumping a little higher. And if I'm not able to do these things for myself and I like give into the fear and buy into all my excuses, I just won't create any, and that feeling was just so uncomfortable. Uh, so that ad, um, a thousand percent, uh, loved it. And yeah, so great. That's great. Thank you for sharing that story. That's yeah. yeah. Well, shall we, Brandon? As uh, well. So yeah, if uh, like the, just a real quick, where can people find you online? Uh, yeah, I think I know not everyone's on LinkedIn, but that's kind of where I've been creating. So uh, you can also so you Dan Elkin on LinkedIn or subscribe to my newsletter. It's called a self help guide for creatives. So it's not just for advertising creatives, although I do like that ad I just shared. We'll, we'll share that and, and along with a little life lesson. So you can find that at Nelkin dot com and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll vouch awesome. for that. It's one of the only newsletters that I read, even though I sign up for many. Um, Dan's is one of the only ones I read because while he has um, as much wisdom as Stephen Pressfield, I think you're a lot funnier. So eh, thanks. Yeah, I don't even know why I have one, and I don't like newsletters, so maybe that's why it works for people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming out, man. It, right. uh, I, I got a lot out of it. Uh, I, I don't have the book currently, but I will be picking it up. You've sold right. me today, so hey. awesome. All right, Th thanks. Uh, Billy and Brandon really appreciate being asked and uh, yeah can't wait to, to share it once it's out that will be all for this episode to keep up with the show follow us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter at Scratch Claw Push if social media isn't your thing you can contact us at Scratch Claw Push at gmail.com this podcast has been a Carcutta Media production for a full list of our podcasts go to carcuttamedia.com slash podcasts this recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for use of brief quotations and review. Copyright 2023 by Carcutta Media, LLC. All rights reserved.